for a long time I've been wanting to make a video about how to actually drive one of these big old 42 foot diesel pushers and uh, some of the <clears throat> excuse me uh, unwritten rules and and uh, thought processes that you learn along the way um, just to give some of my background is before I did this I, w I have had my class A uh, big truck license uh, to drive you know and uh, and so I, I have some extra training behind me no matter how ridiculous this thing looks and my wife has told me I'm not allowed to leave this coach with this on it is very very helpful and beneficial um, a friend of mine bought this for me in Kansas City and I used it all the time it's hands-free uh, it even it could it connects to my CB it connects to um, you know my music everything everything comes through here it's uh, it's a good tool and speaking of that I was going to, another kind of neat thing about Waze is that Waze is also connected with Spotify so literally you can hit the Spotify button and keep your Waze app up and but music is playing through your Waze app from Spotify I think that's and so that plays in through here uh, when I don't want to disturb her I would just suggest that if you're a co-pilot be a co-pilot there's more that you're doing than just sitting up there um, it can be very uh, mundane in this chair and you need to keep that person engaged something else I thought of is that when you pull into truck stops something that you may not know this is something that I have found flying J the majority of flying J's have RV islands specifically made for them it has a dump usually has a dump station water fill uh, check your tires and diesel and uh, gas. However, most truck stops, the majority of truck stops, don't have this feature. So a lot of people question whether or not it's okay to use the big truck lanes at a truck stop for diesel. And the answer is absolutely. And they're used to it. It's normal. Don't worry about it. Just pull right up there. A couple things you need to remember though. So your normal card at the pump won't work because they're used to a certain card, a company card, and they they they're if you notice the the keypads have a lot of alphabet and numbers on there. That's because they have to put in their company name and their truck number and their fuel number and all that kind of stuff and, and it's just information that your bank card doesn't have so it'll literally say you must come inside so what you do is you take your card inside you pay for the fuel I always say a little bit more than I might that than I might need like two hundred dollars and I might only pump 150 it automatically goes back into my card so um, you have to pay up front so you might not want to be making multiple trips um, one other element to that is that when you get done pumping your fuel, get out of the way. What they do is, is all trucks, most all trucks, including most diesel pushers, their fuel tanks are right up by the front tires. So that means that they're only going to pull in this far, get their fuel, and then when you're done with getting your fuel, you can pull up enough for the next guy to get in or just go ahead and get out of the way and go park most truck stops they're used to trucks parking back there so 
the, the parking spots are back in only. But almost all of the time you can find at least a few pull through spots. If not, you can park it alongside of a fence or something like that. I, I, I think I found one truck stop where we just couldn't park in there and had to move on. So just some information of etiquette, uh, truck etiquette, and that kind of brings me to what I would call uh, Walmart etiquette. <laughs> And even if you are allowed to park there overnight, don't put out all your sides and your lawn chairs and your stereo or you're watching your TV. It's not an RV spot. It's an overnight place to sleep and get up next morning, get some product from Walmart and then leave. Um, I, I see so many people, they're like literally camping in the Walmart parking lot. Uh, you know, just don't, you, there's no reason to be rude. Usually what will happen is those parking lots will have designated areas where they would prefer uh, big rigs to park. And uh, so, you know, if they don't, then just what we do is we, we park as far away from the doors as possible. is more of a driving actual tip and and probably most of you know it <clears throat> but anytime with this big steering wheel one of the scary parts about driving these big rigs is that the steering wheel can feel very loose there's a lot of play in between them so if you're not careful you can literally be driving like you know like this what I try to do is I find my power side in other words, if I'm turning right, I move the steering wheel to where I feel it pressure up. And then I just kind of ride that pressure just lightly so I'm not jerking the wheel and I'm not my wheel's not floating freely in the air. So now I'm going to straighten up, and as I straighten up, I'm going to try to keep my steering wheel in the middle. However, I'm kind of pressing... I can see there's a left turn up here, so I'm kind of already finding my pressure side to the left. So that I'm not going to, all of a sudden when I start turning left, jerk the steering wheel and turn left. That's what causes many accidents of overcorrecting and all that kind of stuff. Another huge tip is most, I see a lot of people make the mistake of driving these, these, these coaches like this, where they're kind of manhandling it with their elbows up um, there these are mostly designed to where you put the get the armrest and your seat in the right location to where you you rest your elbow down on the armrest and then put your hands on the steering wheel and you're literally driving like this so I when I'm going straight I drive like in the right in the middle with both hands and now I see it starting to curve to the right, so I'll start automatically starting to timber over and find my power side of the steering wheel. But I'm keeping my elbows down on the armrest, and a lot of that is better control, but a lot of it is just keeping your arms from becoming exhausted. You will literally wear out your arms and your neck if you're tense and holding the steering wheel straight like this. This coach, uh, one of the benefits of having a Freightliner chassis on this motorhome is that it has the Freightliner big truck steering wheel, which has all the same features in a, as in a big truck. And so I get, I get my, my cruise controls on my left hand, and then up top of my left hand is my flashers for my headlights to tell other truckers that they can pull over in front of me. And then on my right hand, for my flashers, so that when big trucks pass me, I can give them the symbol with the front headlights to let them know it's safe to get pulled back into this lane. With my right hand, I've got all my windshield controls, which is includes on-off, 
very and variable speeds um, but it also has at the top it has my my blinkers my flashers in the back to let people know that have let me come back when I've passed somebody and coming back into the lane safely and they've let me know that by flashing their lights I can hit that and let them and let them know that I appreciate that by saying thank you by hitting your flashers those are what those are for just so in case you didn't know I personally am a big fan of cruise control I don't know how anybody drives just with their manual foot it just would just exhaust you within a couple of hundred miles um, and then not only that you're going to exhaust your passengers because you're just <laughs> I drive primarily through my cruise control if I I set it and then if I'm going to go a little faster then I use my my the finger the my fingers on the steering wheel and hit uh, my the button to go speed up and speed down using my cruise controls on my steering wheel. For example, right now I'm just got out of the construction zone. I got off my cruise, went down to 55, and then as soon as we got out of the construction zone and started heading uphill, I just hit my resume. I don't need to, there's so much wasted fuel if you go manually with your foot. Please keep in mind that these truckers out here, the, this is their work place. You, I, I take it a personal like responsibility to try to take care of these guys. And what I mean by that is not do ignorant things that cause them to to have to put on their brakes or have to uh, have to get out of their normal routines. So for instance, I got a truck coming up here on my left hand side and I can tell by his speed that he's going faster than I am. And I'm coming up a hill and about a quarter mile ahead of me, there are trucks in my lane that are slower than I am. I'm going to want to get over to pass them. But it would be ignorant of me and rude of me to pull over in front of him while I can tell he's got the speed. So I, this is his job. He's trying to get to get, drop his load and get on to his wife and family. So I'm going to stay in this lane and let him go by. And that, that means I have to break to give him space and distance and see he's flash. I'm flashing him now, let him know it's safe to come over. And now he's flashing his blinkers to say thank you. So perfect example right there live. Um, another thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, when these trucks go uphill, they obviously if they're loaded, their payload is so heavy they're going to be going slower so if you do pass them which is fine to do so make sure that you understand that when they start coming down the other side that same payload that slowed them up will slow them down will then speed them up and do not pass them and then get over in their lane because they're coming down that mountain and they need to air their brakes and they need to some free area to go. I see guys, they'll pass them because they're going slow and then they'll get over and impute their lane. And next thing you know, the trucks coming down the lane are now having to get heavy on their brakes because you don't get out of the way. You, They may need to go a little bit faster just to uh, cool their motor off, cool their brakes off, and just just don't get in their way. That's a, that's a big, a big uh, thing that frustrates them. Trust me. <laughs> kind of a funny coincidence. But one of the greatest tips that I could give you, I learned by uh, failure. 
and I just happened to be at the exact spot where we learned one of our greatest RV lessons and uh, quote unquote newbie mistakes and I, I made a video about this and I'll put the link above already we pulled into this truck stop right up here and we were just going to pull in and and uh, get some food and maybe do a little bit of rest we'd been driving quite a while and and when we pulled in <clears throat> one of the things you have to remember with these coaches is you have to know ahead of time what your parking situation looks like don't just whip in willy-nilly and think it'll all work out because right here it did not work out for us there we pulled in and there's a there's a parking lot on the left hand side of this truck stop and I right there if you look I pulled into that and then made the u-turn when I made the u-turn I didn't see it when I pulled in there but there was a giant um, hole in the ground where a pipe had busted underneath the concrete I thought I could straddle it and there was nowhere I could go I couldn't back up I had to go forward and as I went forward the rest of the ground gave way and my coach went to the frame hit bottomed out and when that happened it tore the entire front end of the fiberglass part of this motorhome off and laid it on the ground thirteen thousand dollars worth of damage done all because I whipped into that parking lot without knowing exactly my entrance and my exit strategy <laughs> I, I think that leans to this thought process too we've just gotten to the point that we don't pull into almost any parking lot unless it's a big national truck stop loves ta pilots flying j um those type of of uh actual truck stops will are usually the only things that we'll pull into and even there even there i'm careful one wrong move one wrong turn can cost you 30 minutes or more if you if you turn wrong off of an exit um, one wrong entrance into a parking lot can can really ruin your day right <laughs> and for us it was ruined a whole month it was it was terrible it was a terrible experience and I didn't even realize that what it was almost a year ago today that it happened right there in that parking lot right here in West Virginia as we're entering Ohio so uh, I remember driving I got so mad I put the front end of this that of this motorhome I put it right here in the living room and I drove as hard and fast as I could to Michigan so angry uh, I didn't talk the entire time that that takes us into Ohio Another tip about the instrument panel and what to look for is not only the oil pressure, just looking down, making sure that you got good, you know, oil pressure, but the volt meter. That turned out to be a crucial piece for us that saved us a lot of uh, heartache. I just looked down and saw that our volt meter was below normal charging and the problem with that is, is that there's 
comes a point that your battery, when it gets below a certain voltage, your batteries, uh, if they're not being charged, your coach will just shut off. And you can literally just be going down the road and you lose power and next thing you know, you're having to be on the side of the road and get a tow truck. When I noticed that, that the voltmeter was low, I was able to pull over to a truck stop, turn on my generator, and put a charger on my batteries for like 30 minutes, and then go on down the highway for about 30 more minutes, and then pull over, charge 30 minutes, and I had to do that until I could get myself to a shop. What, what that saved me is the bill of having to be towed. Now, we do have roadside assistance, and uh, it has come in handy in California. It was a real good benefit there, but um, I would still rather deal with this kind of stuff than taking the chance to be stuck on the side of the road because anybody that's ever had to be towed or uh, be rescued from the side of the road knows that it can take literally all night before you're rescued. So reading that voltmeter let me know that my alternator had gone bad and turned out not only my alternator had gone bad but my uh, my inverter had gone bad. One of the two happened first, I'm not sure. And I replaced both of those things and there's a video about that as well and I put it up at the links right here. You can watch that, what we learned about that. One last point I want to throw your way is uh, when you get to where you are getting a little sleepy, a little tired, I always reach for pistachios. <laughs> they don't sponsor me. They should. They should sponsor me. But for real, I don't know what it is. Um, it's your motor skills, you know, you're taking it out, put it in your mouth, you open it up, you know, spin out the seeds. It does something to where it... Huh? No, you don't spit out the seed, you spit out the shell. <laughs> but what I notice is that it's just, uh, it keeps me alert and awake. And it's almost like uh, Pavlov's dog now. Because as soon as I get sleepy and I reach for these, I don't even really need to, to uh, get them and put them in my mouth. As soon as I pick them up, it's like I wake up. It's the craziest thing. So, but really, something like this if uh i just always have these on hand this is uh the salt and pepper that's my favorite it's a little spicier but some of them are just roasted and salted those are good too but they literally honestly work this is what this is my go-to stay awake tool it's about to fall off we hit a really bad bad wonderful Ohio bump in the road and uh, I looked up my mirrors about to fall off <laughs>